All right, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, however time you're watching this. Uh, we're into uh, the Christmas season and our uh, international lesson follows along with the Christmas theme. Uh, today we're looking at Matthew chapter 1. Uh, I'll also kind of touch into Hebrews chapter 1, uh, but uh, Matthew chapter 1 is, is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, years ago, and you can go back in the Old Testament, and you've got the who begat, who begat, who begat, who begat, and I remember when I was reading the Bible as a little kid, I, that didn't make any sense to me whatsoever, or it had no significance to me. But now with Ancestor.com and everybody trying to find out where their ancestors are from, uh, and, and probably looking for some significant person in their history, not a tell of the Hun uh, or Genghis Khan, uh, but somebody that uh, was famous for something, or uh, maybe a president of the United States that you're related to. Uh, so we're into that. Now Matthew is into it uh, because he wants to show how Jesus is in God's line for God's purpose, uh, that he belongs in that. But as we look at that genealogy, now Luke has one too. Uh, you go to Luke chapter 3, you'll find another genealogy. Uh, Matthew and Luke are the only two of the four gospel writers that talk about Jesus' birth uh, or, and his childhood uh, in, in terms of that. And really Luke is the one that talks about that, although Matthew has the coming of the wise men uh, when Jesus was a young lad. Now, if we're looking at that, there's a couple of differences that are pretty significant. One, uh, Matthew takes the genealogy back to Abraham. Abraham is the first, uh, the leader of the Jews. Jews always would speak of themselves as the, um, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where they would speak that they are the uh, followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the three patriarchs, or the three uh, leaders of, of the Jewish faith of the Hebrew faith. So, Matthew goes back to Abraham, because that's important. Luke will go all the way back to Adam, because Adam is the father of the whole human race. And Luke is very interested, because Luke wasn't a Jew himself. He was a Gentile. Uh, he, he wanted the, the message to be out there that God is the God of all peoples. Now, he will also talk about the Hebrew heritage some, but Matthew's going to be very strong on that. Matthew's going to quote the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, even um, Samuel and Kings, those books. Uh, he will quote, whereas Luke won't, because Luke's readers were not familiar with those books, whereas Matthew's were. So Matthew goes all the way back to Abraham and takes it down to Jesus, who's the son of Joseph, as it was seen, uh, the son of Mary. Um, and, and so he brings it down to that, uh, to that time. Now, he gives three, three sections that he talks about. I can't make my fingers work to show three without holding one down. Three sections. And he's going to, each of those sections kind of um, is an episode or an eon in terms of uh, God's plan for his people. So he begins with Abraham and he goes up until the time of David. Uh, so that's, that's a thousand years almost uh, in there uh, that he's talking about uh, and, and he calls it 14 um, generations. Now there are some names left out, there are some that he includes, but he wants to show this number 14 so that you have that 14 generations. Then he goes from David to the fall of Judah, not the fall of Israel, that happened uh, about 700 years before uh, the time of Jesus, but the fall of Judah happened about 600 years, a little less than 600 years before the time of Jesus. And he says, that's 14 generations. And again, he uh, varies it a little bit because that 14 is very important for him. And then he goes from the return from Babylon, that is when the people were allowed to return to the time of Jesus himself. And he says, that's 14 generations. Now, why is he interested in 14? One is he wants to show that Jesus is the new David. Uh, David was to have the throne that would last forever and ever. And, and if you go to Isaiah, 
uh, the scripture that we quote oftentimes, Isaiah chapter 9, it says, as uh, his kingdom will be forever. Uh, that's a, a reference, of course, to the, the renewed David. But the renewed David, as far as Matthew's concerned, is Jesus. Uh, and so he's very careful to do that. And if you take the word David, now in Hebrew, there are no vowels. You, you just have to know the word. Um, they've added them later. When I took Hebrew, uh, we had what we called vowel markings uh, to help us because we didn't know what we were doing anyway. But in real Hebrew, uh, they're only consonants. And they don't have numbers in Hebrew. So you take the letter. Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph. Now, it's alpha in the Greek alphabet. It's A in ours. Uh, that would be the number one. Uh, Aleph B uh, is the second word, a second letter, and that would have a value of two. And it's similar to our B, our beta in, in Greek. And then Gimel. Now, Gimel doesn't look anything else. It has the G sound uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, but that's, that's uh, uh, the third letter. So that has a value of, of three. Uh, and then Dalif is the fourth letter. That's the D sound, and that's the value of four. Now, if you go back again uh, into the alphabet, uh, the sixth letter is a wow. That's our W sound. That's way towards the end of our alphabet, but it's the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So you've got a Daleth at the beginning of the word David, you've got a Daleth at the end of the word David, and you've got a wow, which is the V sound we would have. Uh, they don't have a V sound, it's a W sound, and that adds up to 14. And Matthew wants us to know, uh, and particularly his readers, that, that the generations God was preparing everything for this time of the anointed one, the Messiah. Uh, and that, that's what his goal is, is to present Jesus as the Messiah. And so when we get into the wise men, two lessons from now, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that. Now, the, the thing about this is we've got all of this leading down to uh, Jesus, but there's some bumps in there that uh, don't seem like they ought to be there. For one, when we think of the history of the people, you think of Moses. Moses is a very important person. And his brother Aaron, uh, they're of the tribe of Levi. Uh, that's an important tribe is Levi. Now you've got John the Baptist, his father uh, Zechariah was of the tribe of Levi and Elizabeth was as well. See it was very important to be in that priestly tradition uh, for that. But Matthew's not going to talk about that. Luke will, but not Matthew. Uh, Matthew is very concerned that Jesus is a descendant of David and the tribe of Judah. Moses was in the tribe of Levi. Well, then we could go back to Joseph. Joseph, who was the great leader of his people, went down into Egypt and, and rescued his people. Um, he, uh, he was going to be one of the 12 tribes, but it was his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, that became the tribal leaders. And Joshua, who replaced Moses, was of the tribe of Ephraim. That's strange. Well, then we could go on. Saul. Saul was the king of Israel. Ah, tribe of Benjamin. Ah, that's Rachel's descendant. Her child. She died giving birth to Benjamin. So that's, that's important because this was a, a special wife of, of Jacob. And that was the one he loved. But Judah. Wait a minute. David is a descendant of Judah. But Judah was the firstborn of Leah. Leah named her son unloved because she felt unloved by her husband who favored Rachel. Uh, why would God choose Judah to have the descendant who will be called David? Uh, in Isaiah, the scripture says that God says to his people, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts 
are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than yours. Now, that's not a put down. That's just saying, God says, I see it differently than you see it. Uh, if you think about the time when Samuel went to pick a king to replace Saul, Jesse had all these sons, and he brought them out, and they were good sons. They were, they were strong soldiers, and they were, they were good, skilled, as well as being good farmers. And Jesse said, these, these are the ones you want to look at. And Samuel looked at each one of them and said, not the one, not the one God's going to tell me which one. Don't you have any other sons? And Jesse said, well, I got the one uh, out there. He's out, you know, playing the harp and watching sheep. Uh, you know, Dad didn't see him in the same light as he saw the other boys. Uh, they were the born leaders. David didn't seem to be that. He, he much preferred writing poetry, uh, you might say. But he brings him in, and Samuel says, this is the one. This is the one. See, God sees differently. And, and Samuel records that God said to him, man looks on the external. God looks on the heart. Now, we could say, okay, David is a special guy. He is. But when we look at that genealogy, there's some more problems. For instance, we've got this situation here. I'll kind of look in my Bible here uh, and go back to the Matthew's genealogy here. And we've got uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah. There we've got Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, by Tamar. Well, what's this woman doing in there? But Tamar's not his wife. Tamar was his daughter-in-law. Now, there's a custom among the Hebrews that doesn't make sense to us, but the idea was that uh, if your son married uh, a woman and he died without any children there was a responsibility of a family, a brother, to produce children for his brother by the widow uh, so that they could inherit because a woman couldn't inherit property. So there had to be a son born to inherit this property. Well, Judah kind of went slack on, on this and uh, Tamar is saying, I have no portion in Israel. She seduced her father-in-law to have a baby. Oh my gosh. Why is this in that scripture? We don't, we don't want to talk about That's a skeleton in the closet. Uh, we don't want to talk about that. It's in the genealogy. I can imagine Matthew, uh, you know, we talk about all scriptures inspired by God. I can imagine Matthew saying, I've got to tell these people about Jesus. He is important. And then he's writing along, and then he, Tamar, what am I writing that for? I don't want to write that. But God says, you write that. And, and I can Matthew, he's got Writer's block. I, I can't write that, you know. Well, that's that's one of the bumps in, in, in the log there. Okay. Uh, by Tamar and Perez, the father of uh, Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Abram, and Abram, the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Solomon, and Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab? Wait a minute. Rahab was a harlot in Jericho. You want her in this list? God, you want me to write about Jesus and he's a descendant of a prostitute? Doesn't make sense. And yet, if you go over to Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, there's a, a tremendous statement over there in that 11th chapter of Hebrews where it talks about the roll call of the faithful uh, in terms of, of God's Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. Wow. That you know, if I do ever do my genealogy, I don't want to find a prostitute back there. I don't want to find incest back there. You know, I'm, I'd rather not know about my ancestors. If it's going, well, okay, but let's go on. 
um, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Well, that's a good name, Ruth. It's a Moabite name. It's not a Hebrew name. It's a Moabite name. And, and here's Ruth in there. Now, she's a good person. She comes with her mother Naomi back from Moab and says, I'm going to be with you. And, and, and so we say, but the law said you can't take a Moabite in for ten generations. And here God says, no, taking her in on the first. She's going to be part of that. And, and so it goes on down through. And then we get to, and David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. Oh, no. Another problem. David had Uriah killed so that it wouldn't look like he had been messing around with his wife. It doesn't look bad for Bathsheba, but it sure looks bad for David. And it's in the genealogy. We don't want to talk about that. Well, that's, that's part of the problem is we, we have these people in there. Now, you know, all of this would not go well with Nehemiah. If you read the book of Nehemiah, which comes just before Psalms, Nehemiah is the leader who brings the Hebrew people back to the Promised Land. And when he gets back there, some have already been there, and he comes back, and, and they've married wives of the land, Canaanite wives. Nehemiah says, this is going to stop right now. And you read that 13th chapter of Nehemiah, and he grabs some people by their beards, and he drives them back, and he says, you get rid of those wives. Nehemiah would not be happy with Matthew's list of the genealogy. It just wouldn't fit well with him. The thing about it is, is that it was at the time of the pilgrims when they came to this country that King James was the king of England. And he wasn't popular with the pilgrims. They didn't like him. Um, one, because he wrote a book about games to be played on the Sabbath, and they said, no, that's not a good thing. And he also did a lot of taxing that they didn't like and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, the Puritans said, we need to clean up the church. And James said, no, we're not going to clean up the church. The church is the way I want it. When he died, his son, Charles, came on the throne. Uh, they didn't like Charles any more and much less than they liked King James. As a matter of fact, the Puritans moved together and they wiped him out. They beheaded King Charles I. And the Puritans took over, and it was a commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell had a portrait done uh, of, of himself. They wanted to honor him with the portrait. And so this artist painted the portrait. And when Oliver Cromwell saw it, he said, take it away. And the painter said, I've made you look good. And Oliver Cromwell said, that's exactly right. You made me look good. You took the warts. You took the blemishes, you took all of those things out, put them back. Well, that's kind of what God did. He, he showed us the warts and all. And why? Because God is the God of the common people. He's not the God of the perfect people. He's not the God of those who never make a mistake. Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians, says to them, Look at, look at yourselves. Not many of you were powerful by the world standards. Not many of you had authority and titles by the world standards. But God chose you to be his own people. A people set apart for himself. In Mark's gospel account, it says Jesus was speaking and this little comment is there and the common people heard him gladly. Common people. That's you and me. We're the common people. We don't, we're imperfect. We struggle. We make mistakes. We falter. We sin. It doesn't please God when we sin. But God loves us. He delights in mercy, as Micah said. He delights in mercy and brings healing to our lives. All right, I need to stop now uh, and, and finish up here. The writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact image of God. So he's saying, when you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus and you'll find out. And that's why we delight in God's grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us again this day. Guide us as we continue the study and the preparations for Christmas. Thank you for coming down and being among your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Talk to you later.